Okay, friends, we're going to turn our attention today to the last chapter of 1 John. I'm going to bring to you the first five verses. We are, some might say at last, we are coming to the end of this long series. Though there are, there are some things, aren't there, in this last chapter. I'm going to be honest with you that I look, I look ahead and I think, Lord, you're going to have to help me. There are some biggies that we're going to have to look at. And um, my prayer is that the Lord would help us to finish strong. As I was talking to Joy last night, that the Lord would help me to know where we ought to go next as we begin to kind of wrap up this series. You know, in many ways... It's not for me to decide where we're going next, it's the Lord's doing. So pray please that we, when we move on from this epistle, which I was certain that the Lord would have us to look at, I've always said it's like the, the, the scales that we stand on, though some of you in many ways don't like doing that, even with our own bodies. We don't want to really realise how heavy we might weigh. But the reality is sometimes we do need to know And spiritually, even more so, friends, we need to know where we are at. Where are we? Do we belong to him? That was the real focus that's been really threaded throughout this this letter. It's brought to us, I hope, great joy. This letter deals with assurance that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in many ways, friends, we're going to look at that today. We looked last time at um, judgment. There's no fear in judgment for those who believe. The apostle always uses those terminologies for those who believe, those who belong, those who are children of God. And, 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 and he, in, in a way, he kind of, I use that big word again, he recapitulates these type of things again. He, he's, he's reminding the people, he's reminding the people that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you belong to him, There's no fear in judgment. Judgment is real. There's a day coming. God will judge. And God will separate the wheat from the chaff. But if you're in him, you don't look to that day with fear. There's no fear in love. But you look to it. And in parts, friends, you are Christ this morning. You long for it. Let me read to you. The first five verses of chapter 5. The first five verses of chapter 5. Listen to the words. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love his commandments. Um, Sorry, when we love, let me start that verse again. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he? Who overcomes the world. But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This chapter begins with such things that the Apostle has already spoke of. Again, you will notice if you read in it. If you, if, as we've faced the scriptures that, that we've come to. There is a lot of repetition within this book. We spoke of some. But I think, again, what we see here is a reminder of what a child of God looks like. What a child of God can look like and should look like. Let me note a few things. I want to focus particularly on verse 4 and 5 because in many ways we've covered those three verses prior. Verse 1 says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Let's take the whole context. 
of the letter. I listened in on Nick um, and Darren in my absence last week, and Nick said something that was vitally important, context, not only of the letter, but of the whole scriptures. Don't just pull something out and apply it, otherwise we end up in error. We cannot do that. What's it called, Nick? Tota Scriptura. Tota Scriptura. There we go. So all of scripture, I mean, must take, if I'm going to preach to you faithfully, I must take the whole context of scripture, not only the few verses that I'm referring to, not only the letter to which I'm referring to, but the whole of scripture. The whole of scripture. Otherwise, we go wayward. So whether we're dealing with the great subjects that we, we, we differ on, whether we deal with predestination, whether we deal with eschatology, whether we deal with soteriology, whether we deal with ecclesiology, we have to take the whole of context and deal with it faithfully, not just take a verse. Otherwise, one way or another, we'll end up in error. Okay? So the context here is that there was Gnosticism. Gnosticism, that was arising in the time that the Apostle was writing. In the main it was this, that there were those who had rose up and they were denying that Christ had come in the flesh and that the body of Christ only appeared to be human. So that, that is really the first point that John is making. That's why he's encouraging them. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, then you're born of God. And if anyone comes amongst you and starts telling you something else, denying that he came, denying that the body died and was rose up again, if somebody comes and talks to you in that way, know this, they are not of God and they're not born of God. That's the first thing that we must know in order to get the depth of where we're going to go. So they were denying that Christ has only appeared to be human. Of course, therefore, if you deny that the Christ was not in the flesh, you will have no incarnation, you'll have no death, you'll have no resurrection. We will not have what our brother Richard just read to us. We wouldn't have a sacrifice. We wouldn't have a saviour. These people, friends, are not of God. In fact, John the Apostle says they are anti-Christ. They are anti-Christ. Therefore, they are not born of God. So that's, again, we've dealt with that, but that's a nugget of the heartbeat, if you like, behind some of the writings of the, the Apostle John. What's it mean for us? What does that term there mean? Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is the Christ is born of God. What, what does that mean for you this morning? You see, you know, let, let, me, let me say this. I'm tired of preaching that doesn't speak to the sheep. Look, this has got to mean something for you and me today. What's it mean? There's no point just giving some historical lesson of what it meant then. It's important. But what does it mean for you today? What it means, friends, is what it says on the tin. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I could spend the next 45 minutes talking to you about the Christ of the Bible. And that's what I'm talking about. Not a Christ you have made up in your heart. Not a Christ that fits your agenda. But if you believe, and remember I spoke to you about this some weeks ago. If you believe the Apostles' doctrine regarding the Christ. You were born of Christ. You were born of him. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So it says what it says on the tin. I must make a comment regarding verse 4. And, I must comment regarding that, regarding verse 4 and 5. That we're going to look at. If we're going to look at verse 4 and 5 properly, then we're going to have to deal with the, that which has already been said by the Apostle. You see, as we look at verse 4 and 5, which is crucial for us, and I want it to really bless us and help us, 
We're going to have to get the first part of this chapter right. Whoever believes that Jesus the Christ is born of God. Firstly, I want to deal with that statement from a negative position. From a negative position. I think most of us would agree that we live in a time where the church promotes easy, easy believism. Well, what I mean by that is the being, or that being, if one makes some kind of confession of faith in Christ and says a prayer, that that person has become a Christian. Often this confession is without any conviction of sin. There is no repentance and no change of lifestyle. Yet the church often, not always, but often insists that that person is now a Christian because they said they believed in Christ. That happens frequently. That's probably happened amongst us. We've seen it. Maybe, maybe in the past we've seen where someone's been labelled a Christian. They said that prayer in the height of some emotion, but there was no evidence to say that this person had got any conviction of sin, there had been no repentance and no change of lifestyle. And the reality is, friends, that is dangerous, to say the least. And we must deal with that. I must present that negative position to you because it's a reality. We've seen people come and go. We've seen people, if you read the, the parable of the sowers, you see that that is a reality. That, that when the sun comes out, when it gets hot, it withers away, it dries up. And they go and they revert back to the old way of life. There are people who think they're a Christian because they once said a prayer and did all these things. Again, I'm not here to exhaust that. I'm here to present it to you, to, to have in our minds as we consider the things that the epistle says. But let me say this. To believe in Christ is not like believing in Santa Claus. I put a, a quote in the service sheet this week that Darren said on Wednesday and it stuck with me. Stuck with me. What's it say? Someone read it to me. Faith isn't just to believe that Jesus exists. Faith isn't just to believe that, that Jesus existed. Far more than that. And Darren, D Darren dealt with that on Wednesday. It's not just to acknowledge and believe that Jesus exists. That's, that's not saving faith, friends. It's not saving faith. And that's really what a, the very heart of what I'm, I'm saying today. There is a difference between an acknowledgement of who Christ is and a saving faith. I know people who would acknowledge that Jesus came. That Jesus even did what the Bible said. But I say this to you, they've not yet been born of his spirit. Again, it's a huge topic. But we've got to be careful. Believing in Christ is not... Like believing in Santa Claus. If you believe, then you'll get the toy you want. Much of Christianity has become like this. Say you believe, and heaven is yours. Dangerous. Equally, equally, note that I said that, equally, there are some who think they have believed because they have an intellectual acceptance of Christ. They can tell you everything. They can tell you what that book refers to. They can give you a cross-reference in a meet in a moment. And they have their claim that they know Christ because they have an intellectual understanding. It all makes sense to them. They enjoy the scriptures. I, even as I stand here talking to you now, I have someone in mind who knew the scriptures, knows the scriptures. In fact, the Bible says you knew the scriptures, but you didn't know me. Again, another, another dangerous place to hang yourself. There are those who lazily walk in their Christian life, who hide behind that statement. Well, you don't need to know the scriptures. Wrong. And there are those who think because they can handle the book that they're Christian. Enjoy the preaching of the word. Herod 
love to hear John the Baptist. They enjoy those great debates. Some people are there just to provoke. Some people are there just because they want to argue. Some people will bring up certain topics because really what they want to do is have an intellectual display of what they know. I want to say to you, friends, be careful. Be careful. You want to come and talk to me about a topic that's difficult? Come to me in the spirit of humility. Come to me in kindness. Come to me because you want to help me. Don't come to me if you want an intellectual argument because I won't entertain it. Come to me if you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to me if you want to grow in the knowledge of the one who saved us. Not just to have an intellectual argument. It ought to, be, it ought to not be amongst us. Thirdly, there were those who would consider themselves believers because they were raised in the church. Their mom, their dad, they are Christian. Therefore, they have a decent moral and the conclusion is this, they were Christian, therefore so am I. Equally as dangerous. I won't exhaust those positions, but they are things that we must take care of. Because whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, that can be used so easily and so flippantly. That it, it can really be applied to anybody because they once did this or did that. I was brought up, I was raised up, I believe that. I did that, I said that, I enjoyed church. No. This is real. This is a heart change. But allow me to say, and I must say this, there might be someone even in this room this morning who was in the meeting, who said a prayer, has an intellectual mind, was brought up in, thank goodness, in the church. Who has been wonderfully saved. God has used these means. Because he is a God of grace. I don't contest that for a moment. I don't contest that for a moment. But I raise these three and there's more. Realities. Because they have caused so much damage. And people hang over hell. Thinking they're Christian. When there has not been a rebirth. Had not been born of the Spirit. That person has not experienced being born of God. That's the negative. What about the positive? And that's really the focus this morning. Whoever believes, friends, that Jesus is born of God. Whoever believes Jesus the Christ is born of of God. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. This is a work of God. What a wonderful statement that is. And I hope this morning for those of you, maybe there are those of you who might fit that, that, that negative three. There might be some of you who, who have an intellectual understanding who have not yet been born again. There might be some of you who are just in church being part of the local, who are in church this morning who just like being a part of something. Who have not really experienced saving grace. Who have not yet come to believe. There might be some of you this morning who belong to a family who is Christian. And therefore you presume that you've been born of the Spirit. There might be some of you this morning who have experienced that saving grace. That wonderful saving grace. And you can look on that term that the epistle uh, of John tells us. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You've been born of God. You truly are a child. We've noted all the way through this epistle that John helps us to understand that we have been born of God. And here he does it again. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, then you are born again. You must be born again, the same writer says in John 3. He who is born again, he shall see the kingdom of God. You see, this is a, this is a work of God in the soul of man. 
This is a person who has cried out that Jesus is the Christ. This is a person who has believed and is believing that Christ became flesh and died to save them from their sin. This is a person whose life consists now for the glory of God. This is a person who was once blind, now can see. This is a person who laments his past. Do any of you lament your past? But he looks to a glorious future. Who has repented of his sin. Who loves holiness. This is a person who believes that God has changed them. And not only believes it, but knows it. This is a person who has changed and is changing by the power of the Spirit who abides in him. The Apostle again helps us. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Saints, I, I do hope you hear that. You see, one who believes, one who has been born of God, one who has been transformed from darkness into light, one who is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, one who believes is one that is born of God, and one that is born of God love those who have been born of God. We walked into a church yesterday, many of us have not been there before. What do we experience? You, you go and you wander around, you talk to somebody who's been born of God and instantly you know that you belong to them and you love them. Yeah, that's supernatural, isn't it? Supernatural. We who have been loved, love those who God has loved. We love the brethren. One who is born again, love the brethren. And you love those who belong to the family of God. Also note this very quickly, one who is born of God, love his commandments. The love which the Father has bestowed on you causes you to love his commandments. That's the change. They're not burdensome, they're not oppressive. But they actually become a pleasure to you. You enjoy to please him who saved you. Again, we've covered this. The believer is now a son of God, joint heirs with Christ, and the believer looks like something. That's the nub of the issue. A believer, a son of God, they look like something. They look like something, friends. That person is a new creature altogether. As I've already said, the old has come. The old has gone, the new has come. That's the wonderful transformation. That's what it means to be born again. Let us not be a people, nor a church, what che that cheapens what it means to believe. Let's not cheapen what it means to believe. If we do, friends, we have blood on our hands. So, verse 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. See, that's why we have to distinguish. That's why now we're going to apply. There's something here that's a language of promise. A language of something that is positive. A reality for the believer. That's why we have to distinguish first and go through the negative. See what the possibilities are of false conversion. That's there, that's real, that's rife. This is language of promise. You know, there's so many promises in the word of God that we ignore. We ignore them, we don't claim them, we don't, we don't believe them. Three things very quickly I want to look at. The world. There is something to overcome. What does it mean to overcome? Who and how have we overcome? So who has overcome and how have we overcome? 
So there is something to overcome, isn't there? If, if we want to overcome something, there must be something that's in our way. The world, friends. The world. The world is the something to overcome. The scriptures tell us here that we have overcome it. We've overcome the world. What does the word world mean? Again, I haven't got all the time, but have a look, have a study yourself. Earlier on in the chapter, and again in the Gospel of John, God, God says he sent his son into the world to save the world. He said he loved the world, and then he tells us not to love the world. What? <laughs> so we have to, that's why I said, what I said earlier, take in the context where we go wrong. Cosmos. What's the, what's the world here talking about? God so loved the world. Earlier in 1 John 2, 2, he says, you don't love the world. Well, God loved the world. What? Context. Language. Important. Okay. It is clear here with the language that the apostle uses is that the world is something that needs to be overcome. This has been a theme throughout this whole epistle. Just note with some things. Verse 15 and 16 says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father but of the world. We're told in chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. So what is it that's meant by the name or the title or the word, world? What is it? The world. The term world here is everything that is opposed to God. Everything that is opposed to God. Think on that question that the children are learning. The first question is this. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is... Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The world's agenda and its system is one that is in complete opposition to all of that. God has created man to enjoy him and glorify him. The world's agenda is in complete opposite to that. The world's agenda is everything but that. The world is mankind affected by the fall and is now dominated by the hatred of God. This manifests itself in everything that you see in the world today. You know those people who say, how can there be a God when this is happening? Friends, the answer is easy. The answer isn't complicated. It's because man has rejected God. Man has stopped doing what God would have to do for them. Glorifying him, join forever. Wars, famine, really? How can there be a God? The answer is easy, friends. Very easy. Prefer the creature rather than the creator. Joel Beek says, worldliness is, a hum is human nature without God. Someone who is of this world is controlled by worldly pursuits, the quest for pleasure, profit and position. I think that's fair. I think that's very fair. To describe what the world is as a task in many ways is most difficult. But the word of God makes it clear the ways of this world are opposed to God. I don't think anybody in this room can deny that. You see, indeed, it was the world that had the only begotten Son crucified. Let's not forget that. It's the world who had him hung on a tree. The world has its own agenda. And as John has said, not me, John says, that's Antichrist. You want to see Antichrist? Look at the system of the world. It's Babylon. It's Babylon. Everything about it is opposed to the way of God. 
The way of the world is darkness and is fashioned by the sin of man and the principalities and powers of this age. That's the world. But we're being told we can overcome it. Remember that. It would be easy for us to highlight the most obvious things that we see today in this generation of worldliness in our day. We see a wicked, and wicked it is, agenda of the movement of LGBT. Foul. There's no other word. If you don't like it, if you don't bow down to it, you're the one in the wrong. You're the one in the wrong. This is a system of perversion, and at the very heart of it is a clenched fist in the hatred. Yes, and I use that word, the hatred of God. The hatred of God and a hatred of his creation and his creative order. We, we can see men and governments, we can look out and they seek to do away with that which is good. Have you, have you noticed that? They want to do away with anything that is good and replace it with evil. Sadly, and I'm not going to emphasise this, but sadly the last two years have highlighted the whole thing. The world is in darkness, friends. And it loves darkness. And it hates the light. It hates the light. And who is the light? Absolutely, him who has come. Woe to those friends who say evil is good and good is evil. The reality though, listen friends, the reality is this. There's all, that's always been the deal. There's always been a tower of Babel being built. I hope you understand what I'm saying to you. There has always been a Nebuchadnezzar building his golden statue. And demanding men to worship it. There's always been that. And don't think that that was back then. That is very much alive and kicking today. That's very much the world you system. See friends, that's what sin does. That's what Satan does. And the whole agenda of it is against God. I'm reading it again. I've said already that, that great story. The Pilgrim's Progress. And it gives us a great analogy, a story of, of the reality of all this. That Christians' journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city is one that must face all of this. We're in it. We're in it. That's the world we live in. And that book shows us that with, 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 in a loveliness that is, at least helps simple people like me. But saints, listen to me. We must see... The apostle here is making clear that the world and its ways are real. This is real. This is what we see. This is what we're, the world which we live in. A fallen, evil world. He wouldn't say overcome it if it were not a reality. But I do wonder, honestly, I do wonder if the church has ceased to realise that. I think even within Christian, in the church, we look out and say, well, Lord, what are you doing in Ukraine? I want to say this, the Lord is sovereign and he does as he pleases. He has told us these things. That doesn't make us hard hearted of people that say, well, the Lord has said it, so therefore it's going to... Not, not at all, quite, quite the contrary. We ought to do our utmost and pray that the Lord in his judgments would have mercy. But we, we behave as though, as though it weren't told us. We behave as we should be surprised. Friends, we shouldn't be surprised. We, we always quote it. I've said it in my prayer this morning. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. And all what's happening above the heavens right now, we are seeing it take place in the world. It's real. And we need to stop burying our head and thinking it's not. It's real. It's real. I do wonder if the church has ceased to realise it. That we are in a battle. And I wonder if some of us have ceased to realise that the world, the flesh and the devil are alive and kicking. 
We're people who put our head in the sand and make some passive claim that all is well. Do we do that? Do we do that? But let me say this before I move on. It is really hot in here, by the way. The heat ain't gone off. Let me say this, friends, before I move on. All the while, we can look over there and yonder. We look at our neighbour, can't we? We look over the back garden. And we can look at the news and we can see those people and those governments. And Oh, that's the world. But friends, the world's more than something that's external. It can be very much internal. It can still be here. Still be here with the, the lusts and the passions. It's not only the out there, we have to look to ourselves and see there's a reality in our own hearts at times that we are very much like the world. We need God's help to kill that. We must confess that there's a world to overcome, friends. There's a world to overcome. Both that which is going on in or on around us, but that which is going on in us. So quickly, what does it mean to overcome? You've probably got your Bibles open, but glance over those last, four, those last two verses. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So we, can, we could spend from here till tonight's service... Speaking about the realities of the world, the wickedness, the agendas. We could speak of that movement and that movement. We could speak of governments and kings and rulers. You see, even in that which we tried to encourage the ladies, even then, friends, there was a wickedness. It's in the fall. Since the fall, there's been a wickedness. But we, could, we could spend our time doing that, and, and we ought to remind ourselves and, and remember that it's real. But we're out, what I want to focus on before we leave this building today, that the Word of God says to you and me, in fact, let me rephrase that. The Word of God says this, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ have overcome it. Yeah. Not going to overcome it, they have. They have. We're overcome. We are, friends, Overcomers. What's it really mean? What does it really mean to overcome? John tells us that the overcoming is certain. The Greek word helps here. The word overcome. It means this. To conquer. To prevail. And get the victory. We have a victory. We have a victory. A well-known Greek translator by the name of Kenneth West translates this verse like this. Everything that has been born of God is constantly coming off victorious over the world. Seems a good translation to me. Everything that is born of God has victory. Everything that is born of God has victory. Maybe again we've been found wanting in this. The world has its evil ways. Satan is all the while seeking whom he may devour. But dear ones, listen to, listen to this, friends. We are overcomers. Paul says to those at Rome, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Same Greek word. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him. Who loved us. I didn't cover the last passages enough. In fact I'd be very guilty of covering this whole epistle. Nowhere near as enough as I could or should have. But it says there's no fear in love. I want to ask you today. Are you in fear of all what's going on around you? Do you look at the news and are in turmoil and in fear? Friends you ought not to be I tell you. And if you are. You have not yet been perfected in love. There's nothing to fear. You see. Tim Conway said yesterday, didn't he? He sat there and he said, I go on too long. You're in further anyway. I said, he's worse than me. And he is worse than me. He takes way longer than I have paid. And I ain't got time to say the things I really want to say to you. But bad theology. Bad theology. Rank Arminianism, I'm not going to be afraid to say it, gives you an insecurity that you can lose things. 
that you're not called of God and you have to hold it. You have to do everything you can to convert somebody. You have to keep on doing and doing and doing. I, I, I. I have to wake up again and go again. I have to do, I have to do this. Friends, God has called you. God has saved you. And if you believe in him, you have not fear. No fear. Not enemy. Not Satan. Not the fiery darts. You are his. Because he who believes that Jesus is the Christ. He's an overcomer. All that you see here. Salvation is not, it doesn't finish. Salvation is a completion. That's why that golden chain in Romans 8, which I'll finish with, is wonderful. It's wonderful. I must go through this quickly. Brethren, don't, don't need to spend, I'm not going to spend any time on telling you what this doesn't mean and all the phonies out there who tell you that you can have white teeth and brown skin and can anything you want to say. We're not talking about that's not the victory. Victory is more, more than that. It's spiritual, it's salvation, it's providence, it's the care of a father. The Apostle John makes it clear that this is something we have now. You have eternal life now. We have victory now. We have victory over the world now. We have progressive victory over the world. It seems, it's systems, friends, it's agendas cannot harm us. Do you know that? It cannot have you. It cannot claim you. It cannot have victory over you because you have the victory. The devil has no right over you. The world and its friends may kill the body. May kill the body. But I tell you what, cannot have your soul. Because that belongs to the one. And this is why these theologies are so important. I again make no apology for them. Your soul is his who brought it. It's his who brought it. He brought it. It belongs to him. You are a possession of him. You belong to the king. You're his possession. You're his prize. You are his reward. We're going we're gonna to look at that as we go longer on into Isaiah. He shall see the fruit of his travail. You're his reward, friends. You are pleasing to him. He died for you. You are his. You belong to him. Put whatever ism you want on that. But that is apostolic doctrine. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And if you belong to him, you are overcomers. And the Satan has no power over you. I'm tired of weak Christianity. I've got loads more notes, but I'm not even going to go on. <laughs> Father, we love you. We rejoice that you're a God who saves. And that we can rejoice, oh God, that you've saved us truly. Not for a season. Not for the easy times. Because you have purchased us. And we have victory. We are overcomers. And I ask you Lord today. That you will help my brethren. You'll help the sisters and children here as they grow up to believe on him whom you have sent that no Satan nor his angel no dictator no antagonist no gospel hater can come against us because we have victory because the victory is in him it's in him what is our claim Nothing to, nothing, I can bring nothing. And we want to abide in you, Lord. We want to say thank you for salvation. Yeah. The devil has no claim on us. The wicked ways has no claim on us. We've overcome. So I ask, Lord, even in the mess of all of this, you will bless your people. You will be glorified and you will strengthen the sheep. Oh Lord, if there's any fear, may them look to the beauty of Jesus. Bombs can drop and we can still say, it is well. 
Persecution can come as it did to the prophets, but we can cry out, it is well. Lord, I ask this morning, if there's anybody in this room who has not yet believed, that you'll bring them to conviction of sin, bring them to repentance and believe truly upon him whom you've sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we walk this life, this life that has no certainty, tomorrow is not certain, as this life increases, there was... As fuel prices go up, as, as war seems to be spreading, as hatred seems to be again raising its head. Lord, will you bless your sheep and cause them to know that there's no fear in love. Because Christ has overcome. And in him we have the victory. Amen.